Piyush, interesting uh, point that you made about change on steroids. And it is, it can be more, I guess, obvious than the concept of work, the concept of jobs, where it is being done. In the last 12 months, the narrative has really changed. As the CEO of a company, how, how are you guiding the conversation? Uh one of the things we did in the summer, after we'd had about um, four, six months of working from home under our belt, I started thinking about uh, this question, you know, what is work and how is the workforce likely to evolve? Uh, on the one hand, it was quite clear that a lot of people were enjoying the flexibility of staying home, working from their pajamas, not doing the one and a half hour commute in the morning and commute back. Uh, it was quite clear that uh, in some ways, in some categories, this was actually increasing productivity. It was actually quite stunning. Our volumes went up in the first six months of the year. We didn't add people, so productivity obviously shot up. And so you could see productivity went up in some ways. But you could also f find that there were areas that you weren't being able to do that well. And, you know, people have talked about it, ideation, innovation, starting new stuff. And in the summer, it was quite clear to me that transactional stuff and transactional work you do actually get greater efficiency, but some of the other things, maybe not. So in the summer, we actually created a task force. Um, you know, eventually had 200 plus people on the task force with six different streams uh, to try and unravel and talk to both employees, staff, and managers and suss out, uh, you know, what we thought would uh, be the best way to, to organize and think about work in the future. And actually, a couple of months ago, we, uh, you know, did this big policy announcement for our people. And then I talked about a few things. So, one, I think work is going to be distributed a lot more than it was before. I made those comments, uh, uh, that, that point in my opening comment. It's just that it's not quite clear. You can be sitting anywhere and you can be plugged in horizontally to co-workers. And if you're all in a Zoom scheme, frankly, uh, everybody gets equal uh, space. I mean, if you're a box in the Zoom scheme, it doesn't matter where you are or what your role is or what your status is. And so I think it will be more distributed. Uh, the second, I think work will be more flexible. And uh, it's quite clear that people enjoy flexibility, they enjoy the trust, and they enjoy the occasion empowerment to say, I can work from anywhere. However, the task force also told us that you can only be flexible to a point. And this is one of our learnings. It's something that relates to me. I think at the end of the day, uh, if you want to be a company, you need to get alignment of uh, purpose, alignment of intent. You need to have a common culture. You need to build the soul of the company. And it's very hard to do that if everybody is always working from somewhere else. So you do need to build, pe bring people in uh, at least from time to time. And uh, we debated this at length. The task force interviewed people. And we finally came to this uh, conclusion that letting people have flexibility to work from home up to 40% of the time was probably a good thing. So two but, days a week. Not everybody agrees with that view. If you take a look at Goldman's David Solomon, he's made it clear time and time again that he thinks he wants everybody back in the office. He said, this is not the new normal. I want everybody back here. I mean, there's something to be held. I guess there's something to be said about having your workforce together. Yes, I agree with that. So I, I think uh, the flip to that is people have uh, seen the benefits of the flexibility and empowerment you get uh, when you can work from home or work from somewhere else. And I think employees, by and large, uh, won't be happy if they're all forced to come back into the old way of working. And so I think you've got to get the balance, and uh, which is why we came up with this 40% uh, after a lot of interviewing. I think letting people know that a couple of days a week, you have the flexibility to work from home, work from anywhere, etc. But at the same time, I am also agree with David Solomon. I think you give up too much if you don't have people in all the time. And I'm struck in the seven, eight years ago when Marisa Meyer first became CEO at Yahoo, one of the first things she did is scrap the work from home policy. Uh, by the way, IBM did that as well. They had a work from home policy and they scrapped it. And the learnings uh, from the Yahoo experience at least were that she said there is no alignment. People are not, everybody's doing their own thing. So how do I create cohesiveness at a company level if people don't work together? So I'm a believer in that. I think you need to make sure people are together for meaningful chunks of time. But uh, to go back to a world where you say you have to be there 100% of the time, I think it's going to be hard. However, you know, I think there are carve-outs. 
So for example, even in our policy, we've said, uh, if you're a newbie, first six months, we expect you to come into office because that's when you start learning the ways of work in this company. The culture. You start the culture of the company. We've said, if you have performance issues and need coaching, we need you to come in. Uh, we've also said that, you know, how the 40% will work, whether it's two days a week or team A, team B or alternate days, we're going to leave to individual department heads and unit heads to determine collectively with their team. Everybody won't be able to do it uh, in the same way. Right? So if you're a teller at the, uh, you know, in a branch, well, it's very hard for, you know, uh, us to keep moving you in and out. But that's where we found that team A, team B works. We have one shift of people who come in for half the time, one for the other time. So I think we're going to have to experiment with ways of creating flexibility. But uh, knowing that the balance is somewhere between everybody in office and everybody at home. Uh, you talked about how you were surprised by how productivity increased during the pandemic when people were working from home. Yet there's also evidence, a survey was done, a study was done, showing that you know the rate of underperformance doubled in that period. I mean, in the end, it's also an issue of trust, trusting someone to be working effectively at home. I think it's trust, but it's more than trust. It's not that people are skiving off, I think. I think uh, it's about motivation and morale. So what happens is, I found it myself, you know, after some time, just sitting in front of a screen morning to evening, your brain starts giving up. And therefore, if you do this day after day for weeks uh, on end, I think it's not because you have, um, um, you know, uh, a mal intent. I think your actual energy level starts happening. You know, we've all grown up to live lives a particular way. I, I often say coming to, you know, getting up and going to office, going to work is a part of our life. And, you know, we enjoy it, we meet people, we go out for the coffee, we have lunch, it stimulates our brain, it gives us something else to do, it diversifies our way of living. If you change all that, it has to, you know, at the margin, tell on productivity. And that's why I keep saying the, the, the balance is somewhere in between. You don't want to give up a way of life entirely either. The future is digital. The future is now. If you take a look at what the World Economic Forum says, it says that at least 50% of the workforce today will have to be upskilled or retrained. Are we doing that fast enough? Are we at risk of losing the jobs that are needed to be created by 2025? I think we're at real risk, absolutely. Uh, I think there are a lot of new jobs that are coming. I think uh, also the old jobs need to be done in different ways, but it does require reskilling. And therefore, one of the best things that the Singapore uh, is doing, the Singapore government is doing, is this tremendous emphasis on reskilling, workforce Singapore, skills future, reskilling programs, you know, pouring tons of money in helping people uh, re-equip and reskill themselves. But it requires a very cogent and thoughtful, purposeful agenda to do that reskilling. So we started this uh, exercise at DBS in 2016. We identified 1,200 jobs, uh, which we thought are going to disappear in the next five years. And it was clear to me that if we did not reskill and retrain the people, we would have to let them go because those jobs would not exist. But because we started reskilling them and teaching them how to do different kinds of jobs, we've been able to actually, um, about three, four hundred actually quit and went off. But the rest of them, we've been able to relocate, replace and give them new roles. We did the same exercise um, a few months ago. There's 7,000 people have to reskill for the next five years. That is what, 30% of your workforce? We have total workforce about 30,000. So yeah, that's 20, 25% of the workforce because those jobs will not exist. Uh, and you know, in my, uh, 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 I did a town hall with our employees a couple of months ago, the same one where I talked about different nature of work. I made that clear that these 20, 25% of jobs are going to disappear. But I don't want the people to disappear. So how do I make sure that the people are around? Because I do think new jobs are coming up. You know, the kind of jobs we have today in a bank, you never believe it. I have design jobs. I have 100 designers. Nobody thought of designers in a bank. I have data analysts and data scientists jobs. I have ethnographic research jobs. You've got to figure. Now, these jobs didn't exist in bank. These jobs are getting created, but I need to reskill people to do these kinds of jobs. Um, if you don't do that, you'll have a problem. So the issue to me is really this, that the countries where this reskilling is not happening because they don't have the resources, the companies in which the reskilling is not happening because they've not dedicated enough uh, effort to that, I think that would pose a problem. So the next decade, the transition of the workforce, I think, will be challenging. And because, you know, we, I talked about the social issues, because inequity is already a big problem in society. The bottom of the pyramid is already hurting. 
you layer on that this challenge of unemployment rising because we're not reskilling and not transforming the workforce, I think you could be in for some fairly um, uh, difficult time. Can you future-proof work? Can you future-proof your career? Because when you talk about skills, they become obsolete so quickly. Yeah. So my general view on this is you've got to, it's very, it's very easy to say you have, you've got to think about the future and forecast. And reality is very hard to do. And it's always good to have a nose and see what's coming around the corner. But uh, I mean, it's very hard to predict. And because the, the scale and pace of change is so immense and rapid today, everything is coming from left field. I used to think about banking competition. Now Grab is my competition, Singtel is my competition, e-commerce companies, Google, Amazon, everybody is my competition. How do you respond? So the only answer is to build resiliency and adaptability. And so we want to. What, what does what does that mean? I mean, you know, you talk about emerging economy, uh, emerging technologies like AI, cloud, so on and so forth. I mean, what skill do I need to ensure I have a job tomorrow and the day after and the day after? Yeah. So I think it's not a particular discipline. So a lot of people say you need STEM. You know, you need to know coding or you need to be a data scientist. I mean, all of those are helpful. But equally, I believe that half the problems that we're going to face in the next decade won't be problems of computer science and technology there will be problems of the humanities. So there will be issues about how do you think about income distribution in the right way? What is the new redistribution model for society? There will be problem of ethics. What is okay to share in terms of information and what's not okay to share? When you think about the challenges of Facebook, Google and data, those are technology challenges. Those are challenges of morality and ethics and what is right and wrong. So I think being hardbound to individual disciplines is less necessary. I think what will be more important is horizontal knowledge and horizontal education. So the old idea of liberal education, being able to connect the dots, I think that's what you need to be able to respond and grow. The adaptability comes from the capacity to be able to connect dots, to be able to see laterally and to be able to think horizontally. So in addition to deep skills, you need to have those in many ways. But I think if you want to make sure you're you know, relevant for the future, you have to build this capacity to be horizontal. Now, that means obviously learning broad, but it also means, for example, learning collaboration. How do you work with people in a, in a world where it's not vertical management? It's not, you know, top-down leadership, where it's not horizontal leadership. How do you work in a world where you go to influence people? How do you collaborate and communicate differently? So I think these skills, I call them all adaptive uh, leadership or adaptive learning. So to think horizontally, to have broad skills, to have analytics so you can connect the dots, to be able to collaborate laterally, I think those are the skills that you need to be able to succeed in tomorrow's world. Are policymakers doing enough? Are policymakers doing the right thing? When you take a look at the numbers, it's quite, uh, it's massive. I mean, more than 80 million jobs will be lost, but almost 100 million jobs will be created. So are policymakers doing the right thing? I don't think there's a single answer to that question because like I said, depends on the country and depends on the context. Broad I think, brush, how does it look? I think we have a lot more to do. So broad brush, I, I worry that, uh, you know, I think we are behind the curve in terms of the change in the nature of work and the impact of technology on the, the way work gets done and how we need to change. By the way, one of the problems with this is also that many, uh, for, for, for a lot of adults, you learn by doing, you learn by experimentation. You just can't sort of sit in a classroom and see a whiteboard and blackboard and say, think horizontal. You've got to go through the process. So I think we need to be reskilling and teaching people by letting them do and learn by doing. That's not easy. You need to have very thoughtful programs around this. So yes, I think if you ask me generally as uh, 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 mankind, um, are we doing enough? The answer has to be no. Piyush, just how challenging has it been to be the CEO of a company amid such crazy times actually uh, do you have more white hair now than before i don't have hair <laughs> you got to start with, I, i'm blessed no hair <laughs> but uh, you know in some ways i feel blessed that uh, you know some of the things we've been doing at dbs over the last decade as you know i mean uh, harvard business review named us one of the top 10 most transformative organizations in the world and beneath that they spoke to two or three things that have been helpful to us one, they spoke to the fact that we've rethought our technology architecture. That was helpful because, you know, we could pivot on a dime and let anybody, you know, connect from anywhere. And frankly, even our customers, because we had APIs and protocols, we were able to get customers to do their business. 
So our market shares have gone up in the last year just because of the simplicity with which people could connect into us. By the way, even in that, we found we still had gaps. We call them the, the last miles. Uh, but we doubled down on that to plug those gaps as quickly as we could. So from a customer standpoint, it was beneficial. From a staff standpoint, like I said, you know, people all got there. But some people took a month, two months, three months. We took 24 hours for everybody to work from home. And because we had built AI tools, etc., we were able to, within the first 24 hours, do our own contact tracing. Uh, when we had a first case on February 13th of COVID in the building, uh, by the next day, uh, my AI tools could tell, you know, who were the 20 people who'd be in first degree of contact, who were the 250 people who were second degree of contact, who should be quarantined, who should be moved there. And that gave a lot of confidence to our people that we could protect them and that they could be safe with us. So I think, you know, all of those technology things were helpful. But the second thing HBR talked about was that the culture of change and adaptiveness is pervasive in DBS. Uh, and that's true. We spent, you know, our, our mantra for the decade has been that we want to take everybody on the journey. I used to call it a, you know, 20,000 people startup. Uh, today we are 30,000 people, so I call it a 30,000 people startup. But our contrarian view very early on, we're not going to try and make one division or one group of people or the young people or the millennials who are going to do this. I said everybody is going to change. And so all of our change is being driven by the people in the 50s and 60s. The HR head, my compliance head, my company. They're all, you know, 50, 55, 60, and they've all transformed. So when you have a culture where everybody's transforming and everybody's driving change, that's quite helpful in this kind of uh, environment. We, you know, we, like, we set up a war room, we were doing things, you know, whatever. But you have to trust people. You have to give people the flexibility to say, okay, figure out what is the best way to respond. And we're in multiple countries, we're in multiple divisions. We trusted people, we coordinated, but we trusted people. And that you know, nature of the way we work, I think was quite helpful to us over the course of this year. That leads to the next question. What would it take to lead a, a company in the future? Would the attributes be different? Would you need a technological background to understand the intricacies of the digital world? Would, would it take a CTO to be a CEO now? Yeah. So I, I, you know, my view is that what a leader needs to do doesn't change. You need to be able to establish two knots and set a strategy. You need to be able to build a team and bring the people together. Most importantly, you need to be able to create a culture uh, which is a vibrant and aligned culture. And maybe you need to put in the operating rhythm of running the company. And this is not going to change. And what you have to do doesn't change. Also, I think some of the attributes of leadership are quite immutable. You know, so I have a, a, a thing which I've used before called the 5i framework. You need individual accountability. So the willingness to recognize that finally, you have to have an owner entrepreneur mentality. The buck stops with you. You need to be able to set an agenda. So you need to have initiative. Uh, you need to be willing to uh, question the status quo. So you need to be, have innovation. Uh, you need to be able to inspire people, uh, take people along with you for the journey. So you need to have empathy, but you need to communicate better. The communication skills are underestimated. You need to be able to communicate and take people with you. And most of all, I think you need to have intent. You need to have a clear sense of purpose. And that comes with the degree of integrity and authenticity. So I think these attributes are also immutable. So what you need to do doesn't change. Uh, the key things you need to do don't change that much. How you express these, your expression of leadership, that changes. And that uh, it certainly has, because like as a today's technology, you know, when, when the hierarchy got created, the pyramidical organization, it got created effectively by Max Weber, hand in glove with the assembly line. When Henry Ford created the assembly line, Max Weber came up with the you know, hierarchical organization. And there was a reason for that, that if you wanted to run scale operations, you needed to have middle management layers, you needed to have managers manage managers, you needed to have spans and controls. Well, in today's day and age, you don't need an assembly line to be a global company, you can do it from a garage. So similarly, you don't need the hierarchical organization to be able to express your leadership. So the expression of leadership, which is using collaborative tools, creating small teams, having agile frameworks, having trust in people, that expression of leadership without a doubt, that is changing and that will change. And so you've got to change your leadership style uh, to be able to cater for the world of tomorrow. Do you need to be a techie? Uh, I think you need to have uh, enough techie, understanding. Right? Well, think about it. I don't have a computer science background. I learned along the way. I, you know, ran some data centers. I went into e-commerce. I started my own dot-com. But I learned along the way. Uh, but uh, I do think an appreciation for technology is important. What can you do with technology? 
Uh, last in the middle of the pandemic, we ran a program for 3,000 people to teach everybody uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. And we did it by creating, I mean, Amazon actually, they do it. Amazon has a game which lets you learn how to program uh, autonomous driving vehicles. And they spend half a day teaching you to do code, um, a, you know, AI, ML. And then you can run your sort of car in this room. Uh, but because of the pandemic, they also taught you how to run it virtually. And they make a game. It's called Deep Racer. So over the summer, we got 3,000 of our people to learn and participate in Deep Racer as a game. And I mean, it's so something I'm really pleased about. Out of the top 20 people in the world today, uh, five or six are from DBS. And the world champion is from DBS. Uh, and these are all people who learned it because we made it fun and we taught them and they learned. Now, why did we do that? I don't expect them all to become AI and machine learning coders. But an appreciation for how data works and how artificial intelligence works and how could I use it in my job, I think that's helpful. So, long answer. But I think fundamentally the styles of expressing leadership will change and an appreciation of technology will help. But I don't think you have to be a techie. It's setting up for the changes that will come. I mean, when you take a look at the banking sector, it's already transformed tremendously. What changes can we expect maybe two years from now, five years from now, and a decade from now? Well, I think a lot of the changes will be technology driven. So let me stick to that. I think in the next two years, one thing which is on us is 5G, 5G and IoT. In many countries, 5G is being rolled out. Singapore is going to roll out 5G. China is rolling out 5G. And 5G and IoT uh, changes the capacity bandwidth so dramatically that you can really start using visual for a lot more things than you could before. Mm. Uh, and so we already have experiments, for example, uh, an, an, an ATM machine. I don't need to cable it anymore because 5G bandwidth is good enough. And because the bandwidth is so good, I don't need to put a plastic card and type in a co uh, token. It can look at your face and recognize you even without a cable. So I can now plunk ATM machines anywhere. You just go look at the machine and tell it, you know, how. Now that's a small chain, uh, but that'll happen. You'll start seeing uh, payment instructions today come to me from uh, the human being. Haslinda gets in, puts in her name and password, so I know it's you. Tomorrow, your fridge will send me payment instructions. Uh, the car will send me payment instructions. We're getting there. So that's the 5G IoT. The other big change is uh, AI and, in fact, frankly, I think the biggest game changer is going to be AI and ML. Uh, you know, we, much like uh, all the big tech companies, today are employing hundreds of different models to make life easy for you. So if you go and open your, you know, DBS app today, as soon as you open it, it'll tell you simple things like, hey, your bill for this month was too high, <laughs> or that your neighbors are paying less than you are. That's all driven by our AI models and machine learning models. So the using models to make life easier, you're going to see a lot more of that uh, as you go forward. I think blockchain and distributed ledger is hitting tipping point. So it's been around for a long time, but you're getting to the stage where use cases for using distributed ledger are becoming more common. So whether it's in things like trade finance or payments or digital currencies, you're going to see a lot more of that in the next five years than you saw in the last five, uh, as an example. So I think technology will drive a lot of new things uh, over the next five years, for sure. Digital technologies, let's pick up on that. I mean, more and more, I guess, uh, interest among uh, institutional investors, perhaps, in Bitcoin. I mean, it's surging to, I think, in excess of 55,000. Uh, what's, what's your take on that? I mean, it's inevitable, correct? You're talking about digital... Uh, digital currencies. currencies. I think if you think about what is money, uh, the nature of money is quite simple. It's a unit of account, medium of exchange, store of value. And if you just go back in history, you used to take cowrie coins and give them each of these attributes. Uh, and then, you know, you could give gold these attributes. So, you know, you can give this attribute anything. And frankly, for me as a banker, 99% of money is already, has been digital since I was a banker, last 25 years. So when we transfer money to each other, we don't actually physically take currency, we don't take chess, we don't take gold, we don't send lorries. It's all, you know, ones and zeros. It just goes over the waves. And my money goes from my account to your account. It's not visible so much to the normal customer. But for me, currency and money has been digital for a long time now. So the question is really, how much more digital does it get? And at the you know, front coal face, how, how, how much more uh, do people rely on digital? But even there, if you look at Alipay and VPay in China, I mean, nobody uses cash anymore. Everybody just uses a QR code. And you're seeing that increasingly in Singapore in the last year between PayNow and PayLa. Uh, my PayLa, it's just gangbusters. You go to any hawker, you go anywhere, people pay each other, do this thing on PayNow and PayLa. So it's already getting there. 
So from there to the next uh, step of saying, I have a digital coin or a digital stable coin, digital currency is not that much of a step. The key question though is what are the conditions you need for it to be acceptable by governments and nation states and also acceptable in terms of confidence. Mm. Uh, and that requires some hurdles. So when you have a Libra kind of private coin, uh, governments start worrying because when everything is a Libra private coin, they don't control money supply. So if you don't control money supply, then how do you run monetary policy? If you don't run monetary policy, then how do you actually drive the wheels of the economy? You've got to think about those issues. Similarly, if it's all anonymous, then how do you make sure the crooks are not, you know, infiltrating the system? So you've got to put some guardrails around that. I think central bank digital currencies address a lot of that. So for my money, the uh, CBDCs uh, will take off. Um, the Chinese are trying to do it. Uh, Estonia has done it. Many countries are actively working at it. So you, I think you'll see a lot more central bank digital currencies. I think you'll see a lot more guardrail digital currencies. Um, How to? In the next five years, without a doubt. You know, you started your keynote saying that things are better. What's the premise for that? Is it because we have the vaccine and it's getting rolled out in a, you know, in, in a much bigger way? Is it because there's a greater understanding of where we're headed given where technology is? What's driving that optimism for you? Well, I guess fundamentally uh, what's driving that optimism is uh, a resurgence in demand. So if you look at last year, uh, the biggest challenge was a complete destruction of demand. There's never been so much demand destruction uh, ever in, in our history. And all of these minus seven, minus eight, minus nine percent GDP, India, UK, you know, US, is effective because demand died. And demand died because not only the travel die and hospitality die and tourism died, but people sat at home and people couldn't spend. And interestingly, uh, people started getting worried. So savings rates went up and spending rates came down. You know, our data even in Singapore shows that as the governments kept giving people money uh, through last year, more and more of it got saved and less of it uh, got spent. So anxiety stops spending. So the, the elimination of demand was a challenge. You could see demand start coming back uh, towards the fall and towards the fourth quarter. Our credit card spending is a great um, um, indicator. Uh, indicator, thermometer. We were down 40% in the second quarter. Uh, by the third quarter, we were down 20%. By the fourth quarter, our spending is only down 3 to 5%. And as we're getting into this year, spending is back. So I think demand, the demand drivers coming back will be a big change in everything else. The investment cycle comes back. Many of our clients are now talking about CapEx expansion to be able to service demand. Um, I think in some ways, you're beginning to see some early elements of an inflationary cycle in some areas, commodities, which everything's gone 30, 50% up. So you can see some interest coming back in that. Now, what's underlying the demand coming back, obviously, is animal spirits and confidence. So the fact that the vaccines are rolling out better, I think that's helpful. I think people have got their hands around how to manage COVID, Death rates have come down. So all of that is helpful in driving up those animal spirits. The other element of uh, optimism comes from the fact that the amount of government action that has been taken is unprecedented. I talked about in my speech, the amount of money that has been pumped into the system is uh, uh, enormous. And the fiscal programs that governments are putting in place, spending programs, building back, infrastructure, etc., are also enormous. So you take an increase in consumer demand, you layer on that increase in the government and fiscal spend, and then you sort of pepper that with uh, easy money and, and liberal money, monetary policies and cheap rates. Uh, this has to create a massive economic uh, rebound. The risk comes when that is removed. Right. So How do you anticipate that and how do you see that being implemented? I don't see that happening in the short term. What, what right. is that? Two to three years? Yeah, two, three years. I mean, I think all the central bank governors have been quite clear. Uh, Governor Powell has been quite clear that, you know, people are going to let the economies run hot. And as a consequence, if you look at the last decade, uh, actual inflation has always underperformed expected inflation since 2010. Right? The countries kept pushing, central banks kept pushing for 2%. Nobody got beyond 1.5, 1.6. So this time, I think they're pretty intent on letting inflation get to 2.5% before they worry. And which means the next two, three years, I think consciously people are going to let economies run hot. Second, even when people want to rein in, I don't think it's going to be that easy. Uh, and the reason for that is that it's not that easy to take uh, uh, $12 trillion out of the system. The, after QE3, the Fed balance sheet got to $4.5 trillion. They wanted to bring it back to under $3 trillion. They got halfway there, 3.7, 3.8. And then already the market started reacting, and so they had to start liberalizing again. 
So I think it's going to be hard for them to tighten the screws, given how much money that is out there. And uh, one of their, you know, uh, 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 unstated uh, agendas for most central banks now is financial system stability. So people will be cautious about how quickly they start dialing that down. Too. Speaking of market reaction, I mean, if you take a look at the bond market, I mean, 10 years just went to 1.5%. There is a great disconnect in terms of what is expected in terms of inflation between markets and the central bank. 1.5% is not high. So you but that was the target for year-end, and here we are talking about it in February. But nobody knows what targets are. If you look at uh, pre-COVID, just a year ago, the 10-year was 2%. So we're not even back to where we were pre-COVID. And if you go back to uh, inflation cycle, the 10 years, 3%, 3.5%. And pre-2010, the 10 year was 4% or 5%. So 1.5% in the big scheme of things is not a huge uh, bounce back. I do think the market's inflationary expectations are rising. And I think they will rise as some parts of the market, energy, oil, you know, metals, minings, uh, you can see that. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if the 10 year continues to rise and, rise and spike up. But I think the, the, the short end, the policy rates will stay anchored. I don't think so. You'll see a steepening of the yield curve uh, uh, without a doubt. But that's not going to change the capacity of the market to be able to borrow cheap and continue to spend uh, because that's driven to a large extent by the policy. Do you see mispricing in, in assets? Well, financial assets by every token, I mean, I'm, I'm not, a, uh, uh, have all the metrics, but uh, by most tokens, financial assets and financial markets are overvalued. So the fundamentals and cash flow uh, are hard to, I mean, on the basis of hard to support 100, 150 times or 200 times price earnings. I mean, there's no logic to that. But on the other hand, like I said, money is ample and money is cheap and money has got to find a home. And therefore, it's a smart supply-demand question. Uh, more than a fundamentals question at this stage. Money ample, money cheap, and hence we're seeing this retail mania. Is there reason to be concerned or this is just, I don't know, democratic, democratization of uh, financial markets? I think uh, like uh, all of the manias, there will be choppiness. And I think you will see sharp corrections. Uh, because when you're only being driven by supply and demand, then demand vanishes based on fear and greed. So sooner or later, when the 10-year hits, you know, 1.5, 1.72, markets will spook. Somebody will say, oh my God, we should start selling. And then you create a down, downward spiral. So I anticipate a correction without a doubt, uh, because that's what happens when these uh, cycles happen. Nayish, I want to talk about the new government in the U.S. I mean, we have a, a new president in President Joe Biden. Uh, are you more encouraged that there'll be greater stability? Are you more encouraged despite the fact that he has indicated he will still adopt a pretty hot stance towards China? I think in terms of geopolitics, um, um, what he said is correct. I don't think the U.S. stance to China will change fundamentally uh, because I think there's a bipartisan and frankly public belief that uh, you need to push harder on China to get China to play by the rule book, uh, which includes uh, principally access to markets and making sure there's a level playing field, including intellectual property. So I think everybody uh, buys into that in the US, and I don't think they will change the underlying agenda. In fact, in some ways, uh, you will find that uh, in, in other areas, human rights, that agenda will be dialed up. The Democrats are always more focused on the human rights issues and et cetera, so they will dial that up. But I think half the problem with the US-China discourse wasn't the substance, it was the form. And the form will change. So I think you'll have more adult conversations. I think people will try to, you know, play by ex extant existing norms and rule books. I think the Biden administration will try to create a better coalition working with NATO and the Europeans and getting more people together in the process. And uh, the fact that the, uh, the conversation will be less trenchant and less trident, I think that will help soothe nerves. And frankly, if the nerves are less, uh, you know, frayed, uh, people will be able to do a lot more. What do you hope the Biden administration would mean for policy towards Asia? And I'm just also wondering, given how polarized the U.S. Um, uh, the U.S. people are, whether uh, President Biden will be more concerned about domestic issues as opposed to foreign affairs. Well, um, you know, from everything that. Um, the administration is saying, I think they do want to get America to play a leadership role again in uh, global affairs. 
from an inward looking, you know, make America great. And uh, in his last speech at NATO, I think he said America is back. Mm -hmm. So I do think that there is an agenda to make sure that the U.S. plays its leadership role. And particularly over the next decade, that leadership role is going to be extremely important. Uh, making sure that the you know Bretton Woods system and the rule-based order, which was actually orchestrated by the U.S., that uh, continues to have a relevant role as we try to rebuild for a new order and a new society, etc. So I think they will be active. Now, uh, how active they are in the context of Asia uh, and you know South China Sea issues, ASEAN issues, etc., is not that easy to say. You know, uh, President uh, Obama had this pivot to Asia. But when you actually look back, you didn't see that much of a pivot. Um, and so I am not a soothsayer. I don't know how much the pivot to Asia will actually manifest itself. I do hope it does. Because uh, like uh, uh, many of our leaders have said, for Asia as a whole to have a balance between China and US has been very constructive. Our region has done well because for the last 50 years, it's been a region of geopolitical stability, but also a geopolitical balance. And Lee Kuan Yew was, was very fond of saying that the U.S. presence in this region is extremely helpful for all of us. So if I had to express a wish, I would be very uh, hopeful that the U.S. does step up participation in this part of the world because their presence can really help create the stability that we need so we can continue to grow the economies and do the right things for our people. But the increasing tension between the U.S. and China means that it is inevitable that supply chains will change. They have started changing. I think supply chains have started changing. I think the nature and the extent of the change is sometimes uh, exaggerated. Uh, our own work suggests that it is very, very hard to uh, move supply chains out of China uh, anytime soon. Uh, the electronic supply chain, for example, you can do it at the margin, uh, but you can't do it at scale. At least the existing supply chain, you say, I'm going to shut down my plants and factories and move it all out, uh, doesn't happen that quickly. Uh, also, where do you move to? So a lot of supply chains, the incremental, the plus one, we've seen money going to Vietnam, we've seen a little bit of it in Thailand, uh, but in Vietnam, capacity is limited. Within the first year, inflation started picking up because land supply, labor supply, etc., uh, proved to be a constraint. Uh, the auto industry in Thailand, Thailand is good, but you start moving out to India, a lot of people have gone in and putting more money, but not at the scale that you need to move large chunks of supply chain. The other thing you've got to remember is China is the biggest market. It is the biggest consuming market in the world. So if you really want to keep your production and your supply chain close to your market, then guess what? It has to be in China. Mm -hmm. So I do think it will change. We're seeing that change. The plus one is happening. Uh, but I don't think it is happening at a scale where suddenly, you know, everybody is moving out of China overnight. I don't think that will happen. In wrapping up, just two questions. The one thing that gives you the most hope and the one thing that keeps you awake at night uh, I think our capacity to uh, adapt and leverage some of the new technologies and capabilities um, is actually the answer to both questions. Uh, I think today's technology creates tremendous opportunity for us, whether it's on the sustainability agenda, whether it's to be able to track and trace carbon, whether it is to find renewable sources of energy, whether it is to really use AI for public good. I think there's just tremendous amounts we can do to better the lives of people, our businesses and economies, and that's the positive. Uh, but what keeps me awake at night is the other side of the same coin, because these technologies also have the power to do tremendous damage. Uh, they're going to have to force us to rethink what makes us human beings. They're going to have to force us to think about what's the difference between a robot and me. It's going to have to force us to think about cybersecurity at scale. Uh, it's going to have to force us to think about, uh, you know, uh, do we re-engineer our bodies or do we not re-engineer our bodies? These are profoundly difficult questions. And as we talked about before, Hazinda, it worries me, it keeps me awake at night, that as governments and uh, frankly as people, in many cases, we are behind the curve. We need to be ahead of the curve of thinking about what are the guardrails that we need as we move into this new order. And we're not there yet. So that is uh, the other side of the coin. Piyush Gupta, DBSU, always a pleasure to speak with you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Happy to be here.